So I um, am going to fly through the first few questions kind of quick. I want to get to kind of the last two uh, because I really believe they're important. Um, the first question, which actually plays a big part in answering the rest of the question, was how long has the Bible been around? What you need to know is the Bible has been around for about 3,400 years. The first book was written in 1400 B.C., um, and it was either Genesis or Job, that is not Job. So if you're new to the Bible, you're like, who's Job? Right, no, it's not Job. It's actually pronounced Job at that time, and they are the oldest uh, books in the Bible, likely written by Moses. So 3,400 years ago, this is kind of crazy, 66 total books written by 40 authors um, over 1,500 years. The, the last one is the most amazing to me, and they all communicate the same message, that Jesus is our need, and our provision. So you've got books that were written over 1,500 years. You're, you're lucky if you live to 100 years. 1,500 years all written, um, and they, none, of it, none of it contradicts the other. That it, that it all, and, and this you need to understand. You're like, but my, my friends always tell me, how am I going to remember these? Let me write these things down. You need to understand this thing that you use for social media so much, you can Google that. Hey, tell me the facts about the Bible, and literally you can find all that you need to say, hey, no, let me tell you how, um, how hard it is to disprove this. Let me tell you the likelihood that this could ever happen again. There is not nearly... There, there is actually probably uh, 80 of you in this room. So that's double this amount, and you're all in here at the same time, and I guarantee I could not get you all to agree on one thing. Uh, I, we, we talk about something important, you wouldn't agree on it yet. 40 authors wrote 66 books, and they all agreed over 1,500 years, and not one of them spent time in the same room with the other, or not all of them spent time in the same room together. So kind of crazy, which brings me to my next question. What do you think life would be like if Jesus was on earth? What do you think life would be like if Jesus is on earth? This is kind of a good question I want you to know. And, and if you look at the Bible and you're like, man, I can make a large assumption that life would be amazing if Jesus was still on earth. Like, it would be the coolest thing. The problem is, I, I don't think it actually would be as neat as you think it would be. See, I don't think Jesus would be, we think, man, if Jesus was on earth, and then we imagine what, like, Jesus went to my school, like, he hung out, like, I saw him do these things. Hey, you need a newsflash real quick. This is America. Jesus grew up in Israel. So Jesus ain't hanging around us if he's on earth. You need to understand that. So what Jesus would be like if he was on earth right now is he would be likely, you would have the same relationship with him that you have with the President of the United States. You would know a lot about him, you would hear all about him, maybe even on your friend's Instagram story. They're like, yo, I was in Israel because my name's Heather, and, and I, <laughs> I took a Snapchat, right, or an Instagram post with Jesus. Like, I ran into him on the, on the road to Damascus. Like, it was the coolest. You know, like, whatever it is, like, you, could, you, you would see people maybe that, and know people that maybe know of Jesus or have family members who once worked for Jesus. Like, you would be able to have that kind of relationship. But I think overall... You would feel very distant, very distant from Jesus, that it actually wouldn't be as close. And, and I think sometimes we, we feel that way, like, man, if only Jesus was here. But you need to understand that Jesus didn't want you to feel far from him. And so, in fact, in him going to the Father for us, as God's word said, he actually provided a way for us to be much closer to him now than if he was here with us. This is what God's word says in John 14. I'm going to open it up so we can actually read it. It says this. It says he went, when he was going, he said, man, I'm going to go back to the Father. And when I go back to the Father, I will ask him. And he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Some of you have gone through some hard things in life. You deal with some tough things and you go and see a counselor. Why? Because the counselor helps you process and helps you think, helps you see what's right and helps you see what's wrong. They are this mediating force in your life, this steady person in your life that you can bounce things off of and they're wise and they can give you wisdom. And Jesus says, hey, I'm going to go to the Father so that you may have a counselor. He says, I'm, I'm going I'm to go to the Father to give you that counselor, this wise source, this mediator, 
This person who, who, who is steady all the time when your world is chaos and, and he will be with you forever. This is who he says he is. He's the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it does not see him or know him. But you, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Jesus says, man, instead of feeling far from me when I go, I want you to have a counselor who will be with you forever in all places, at all times, in all circumstances, to provide wise counsel, to provide uh, comfort and peace, to provide um, insight and direction into life. What would, what would it be like if Jesus was still here? It would be far less personal of a relationship than we can have now through the Holy Spirit in us. 1 Corinthians says this, for who knows a person's thoughts? And this is the coolest thing. I want y'all to hear this. Like, you've got to understand this. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God, which Jesus just said will be in you. So cool. So now we may not receive the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God so that we may understand but has been freely given to us by God. You have the Spirit of God. It says, man, when you become a believer, when you place your faith in Jesus, that you receive the Holy Spirit, God in us, so that you may understand. I love it all the time. People are like, I don't know what God's will is. I don't know what God's plan is. God says, no, I've given you the Spirit in you so that you may understand the will of God. You may understand the salvation that he's freely given you. He says, we also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. He says, but the world doesn't, doesn't understand it. People don't understand what we do here. I don't, and God's word says, they can't understand it. That when you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, when, you don't, when, when your eyes have not been opened to Jesus, it's really hard for you to understand the things of Jesus. He says, but man, I'm going to give you a spirit within you. In John 14, 12, and we're going to go to another question. It says, truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. This is the coolest part. And he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. He says, truly I tell you, <laughs> the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. But he will do even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. You've got to understand. He says, I'm going to the Father. We just read. He says, and when I go to the Father, I will ask him to give you a counselor. And the counselor will give you power to do things even far greater than I did here on earth. That's the Holy Spirit that lives within every believer. What would life be like if Jesus was here? Not nearly as cool. As much as Jesus is amazing and, I, and he's awesome and I love him and, and I'm thankful for him. We have a much more intimate, much more powerful relationship. Acts 1.8 says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then you'll be my witnesses and you will testify about me to other people with power, not your own. The power that the Holy Spirit brings. So cool. Thinking about the Spirit, we'll go to this next question. Um, it's kind of interesting. Some of you don't even know what the heck this means probably. What did the prophets know um, how did the prophets know when to tell others? How did the prophets know when to tell others? So what a prophet was in the Old Testament was somebody who then went to other people and spoke the truth that God had spoken to him or to them. That he was a person that, that would speak directly through visions and dreams to people. And it was visions and dreams from God. Now you need to understand, I want you to think about the last time you had a dream. Like I want you to think about it real, like a dream, right? Like maybe it was a nightmare, maybe it was an awesome dream, like whatever that dream was, I want you to think about it, and then I want you to start thinking about the details, where were you, who was with you, and what went down. I'm going to tell you, the last dream that I had, I was riding a bicycle up a hill that was so steep, and mind you, my son was hanging on my back. Why? I don't know. And I'm, and I'm going up this hill, and then I realize, like, I'm not going to make it all the way up. And here's what you need to know about mountain biking. If you stop on a steep hill, you're falling backwards. And so I remember, like, I'm hanging on to a root. My son's like, I'm holding on so tight, Daddy, right? And I'm like, yeah, you're, thankfully you're about to die. Like, this is crazy. And it makes zero sense. 
Okay, let, let's just lay that out there. My dream made zero sense. Where I was and why I was doing what I was made zero sense. Our dreams make zero sense. But when a prophet spoke, he had dreams that were concise and precise, that he knew every detail and could repeat and record it and spoke every detail about these dreams because they were not his own man-made dreams. They were dreams and visions that came from God, and so they knew when to speak because they knew these visions. You see some of this, and I will put a couple scriptures in. Isaiah 6, Isaiah 6, it says this. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high. I want you to hear the detail. Thrown on high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, which were angels. Each had six wings, with two that covered his face and two that covered his feet. And two he flew, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory, right? And it was like over and over again, these prophets and their manner of communication was so clear. It was so clear. Unlike what we have, the communication they all, uh, between them and God all bear the same mark. This is Daniel 7. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, in the first year, I can tell you the exact moment that this dream was taking place. Daniel had a dream and a vision passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. He was able to get up and write it down and remember it. You ever have that night where you wake up and you're like, man, I had a dream last night. It was crazy. What was it? What was that dream? And you can't remember it ever. He says, no, no, man, I can remember every detail. I can tell you what like everything, and let me tell you when it was. Again, he says in 8, he says, man, the third year of King Belshazzar reign, I, Daniel, had the vision, already appeared to me in this vision, I saw myself, as blah, 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 right? Like I had all these details. Regardless of the prophet, regardless of the message, they had the details because God spoke to them. And that is the reason our Bible is God-inspired. We can say it's God-inspired because it is so detailed and so precise and so non-contradictory and, and, and so historical and so true in all the worldly aspects of what truth is. And then it's written down for us. Can you hear that? It's written down for us to answer the questions of today to answer the questions that we are truly struggling with and, and truly dealing with. It. They're all in here, and it's all, all right, and it's, and it's all for you. If you'll read it and get into it, and I'm just as guilty as you, I have a hard time sometimes finding time or making time to get into God. And yet, there's so much truth and so much promise and we walk around lost, and we walk around scared, and God says, man, my truth is here. Like, will you read my promises to you? Will you leave, read my love note to you? Will you read what I have? He says, man, it's right here. The next question is one I kind of want to focus on a little bit more. It says, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Many people have come out, and I'm not sure what to think. What does the Bible say about homosexuality, and what should I think? What you need to know is that um, if you've heard any of my testimony, then you know I've had friends who have um, come out as a homosexual, that they've come out. Um, I have a cousin who um, deals with that. I, my, my grandmother, um, actually weird, it's weird when your grandmother um, dealt with that. Uh, it, I, I, I'm familiar with kind of the struggle you're going through, and the question comes up, okay, what do I think? And so in this question, like any good question, about the things going on in our world, there's actually two questions in here. The first question is, what does the Bible say is right? What does the Bible say is right? And the second question is, what is the right response? So you need to understand, as Christians, we really get that jacked up a lot. That we want to know what the Bible says is right, but we don't really consider, okay, then what is my right response to what the Bible is saying should be right compared to what the world is doing? What is my right response in all of it? And that's where we get messed up. I'm going to go to this, what does the Bible say is right first? What does the Bible says is right? You can find it in Romans 1, 25 and 27. That Paul starts this book of Romans, and he's talking about this group of people who have heard God's word and who have run from God's word, that they're no longer listening to it, they're no longer uh, um obeying it, and they're like, man, God, whatever, you, like, we're running from God and his plan. We don't care about it anymore. 
And then this is what God said. He says, uh, they, or what Paul wrote that God was saying, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They exchanged the truth of God for life. You look at Adam and Eve, the first two people in the very beginning of the Bible who God created. They were living in light and truth. And then a serpent came and said, hey, you want more power? You want more things, the things that God's holding out for you? And then they exchanged the truth of God and what he, who he said they were for a lie, believing that God was holding out, and they sinned against God. But this has been the problem for mankind from the very beginning, is that we often exchange the truth of God for lies. And it's really easy when we don't get into the truth of God and don't know his truth. But they knew his truth, and it says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served what has been created. What has been created. Man, there's so much there. Instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. For this reason, God delivered them or gave them up or let them go. He said, okay, if you're going to go, then go. God delivered them over to a disgraceful passion. Their women exchanged natural um, Sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men, in the same way, also left natural relations with women and were inflamed in their lusts for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons an appropriate penalty of their error. That what this is saying, what we see is that if you want to know what the Bible says is right about homosexuality, is it says it was not God's intended plan for life. That it wasn't. That God didn't create man to be with man or woman to be with woman. And I know that some of you in here may even be feeling a little bit of rage in you. You may even be feeling a little uh, frustrated or you may even be feeling a little guilty. Like, man, but I struggle with that and no one knows about it and I deal with it. And he's over here telling me how wrong it is. I'm just telling you what you need to understand is that God said, hey, here is my best plan for people. Here is the plan I have is that I will make a man and a woman and together they will reproduce and they will um, fill the earth. And when a man and a woman come together, that is the most physical and emotional and spiritual intimacy that can be acquired between two people. He says, man, that is what I'm creating a sexual relation for. I mean, that's it. It's a man and a woman. So you want to know what the Bible says is right. It says, man, homosexuality was not the product of God saying, man, be blessed and, and yeah, do whatever y'all want. It wasn't it. What God said was, no, this is the response of sin, of people who are running from God or being attracted to one another in the way that they should um, admire me and love me. That the passion level in which they are attracted to a man to another man or a woman to another woman is the same passion, not kind of passion, but the same amount of passion they should have for God, for me. And but, but you don't, so I'm going to let you go and you will receive the proper error, the proper penalty. What you find out, you need to hear this, what you find out is that the homosexual population has a much higher anxiety rate and a much higher depression rate. And often they have a missing father in the family and often there is a higher suicide rate. That, that It is not a, a, a good thing or a fun thing. It is simply a product that it does not lead to better and further life no matter what the world is telling you. This doesn't, and I may catch all sorts of flack from this. I believe in God's truth. I believe you need to hear it. But on the other side of that, where we get messed up, is what is our right response to that? How do we respond correctly to that? See, you need to know that there's a lot of people who struggle with homosexuality and who, who struggle with other things who won't ever step foot in these doors. Why? Because of one word, judgment. That they feel if they come in, they will be judged. And here's the problem with, with churches today, and I don't even know if it's ours. You know if it's ours more than I know if it's ours. You know who won't and will come, and you know what reason. Here's the problem with churches today that they have become a group of people who are judging people's sin that is more outwardly expressed while dealing with their own sin that just happens to be more hidden. That it is people who have a hidden sin who are judging people with an outward sin. You hear that. 
That they are no better, but yet they have assumed a better position because their sin is less known. Because people don't see it. Maybe people don't hear it. People don't understand it. And that's why we've gotten real messed up because that is not God's intention for the Bible. However, on the other side, when we hear, when we hear there's a problem, when you hear something that you don't think, uh, what, or what you believe, you don't think it's right, like when you hear me say something like, hey, homosexuality is not what God planned for, what happens if you're in here and you're feeling an emotion, it's probably an anger. You say, man, I don't really like what you're saying. I don't really, really like how you're saying it. I don't really like it. And what's happened is you've taken what I've said about the truth of God's word and you've taken it personally because it's a struggle you're dealing with. And so you're taking what I've said personally. And so often, that's how we handle it, is that we, we, we begin to think less of people because we are assuming that because they disagree with us that they are being personal. That's the thing your generation is going to have to fight. But just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean that they're personally condemning you or judging you. You got to know that. You got to know that's my position in this place right now. Because here's what God said is the right response. Here's what God said is the right response. It's Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with your heart one believes and is justified, and with your mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction, you need to understand, I'm going to explain this to you, between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This thing between Jews and Greeks was a big deal. This is like going back to the 1960s and he's saying there's no difference between blacks and whites. This is like going back to the Alamo. If you're from Texas, you know the Alamo. And it's like saying there's no difference between uh, Hispanics and Americans. This is like going all the way back to saying, man, there's no difference between England and those pilgrims who've come. This is a big deal. What are you saying, man, when it comes to Jesus? It doesn't matter what your background is or what you've done or where you're going. It says there's no difference that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, I think what Paul is saying here, if he was to answer this question about sexuality, what he would say is, what's the bigger deal, someone's sexuality or someone's salvation? Hi, Kennedy. I think he would say, man, the bigger deal in our life right now is not necessarily someone's sexuality. Like, that's a small part of who a person is. The bigger deal in someone's life and in your life and in your friend's life is their salvation. That when you begin to look at Scripture this way, when you begin to look at Scripture this way, what you begin to see is that there's only two types of people. There's only two types of people and there's only two ways that we need to look at people. first type of person is someone who knows Jesus. Hey man, are they someone who knows Jesus? And the second type of person is someone who needs Jesus. They say, man, there's no difference in Jew or in Greek or in any of that. He says, man, here's, what, here, here's the eyes that we are called to have as believers. Does that person know Jesus or do they need Jesus? Hey, that's someone who knows Jesus. That's someone who I can pray with. That's someone who I can talk with. That's someone that we are on the same side of salvation. 
That's someone who needs you. That's someone who I need to love. But here's what you need to understand. That our job is not to change our friend's behavior. I need you to hear that. Our job is not to change our friend's behavior. Our job is to introduce them to Jesus so he can change their heart. That our job is not to change our friend's behavior. Our job is to introduce them to Jesus so that he can change their heart. So that he can bring peace to their life, to the thing they are searching for. That's our job. That's your job. It's not to say, hey, the Bible says you're not supposed to do that. Hey, that's wrong. No, no, our job is to say, man, let me love you. Let me show you Jesus. Let me introduce you to this guy who saved me from a lot of stuff. It brings me to the last question. It says, how do I ask, how do I ask friends if they are followers of Christ without sounding pushy? How do I ask friends if they are followers of Christ without sounding pushy? One reason I love this question is because you're actually asking it, which means you actually care about sharing Jesus with your friends. You need to understand that you have the greatest truth known to mankind in your heart if you are a believer. And there's a world living in darkness, and you are the light that walks into it. It cannot be overcome by the darkness. Some of you have muffled it. Some of you have hidden it. Some of you are ashamed of it. So how do I ask friends if they are followers of Christ without sounding pushy? It comes down to your motives. What's your reason for sharing Christ with them? Is it because you truly care if, if they are eternally saved, if, if they know the peace of Jesus? Or is it because you want to do something that makes you feel good and the Bible says you should do it? See, your motives will determine how you come off. Your motives will determine how that works out. 1 John 4, 10 through 14, and I'm going to end with this verse. It says this, love, cons love consists in this. I just want you to hear this. Like, I, I really like, if you've been distracted this whole time, if you're kind of like dazing out, I want you to just like maybe slap yourself in the face. I don't know, whatever you got to do. Yeah, wow, that was, I heard that. Uh, but I, I want you just to hear this. It says, love consists in this. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. So dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, I need you to hear it. God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. That in fact, when we refuse to love God's creation, when we refuse to love the things that God loves, God is saying, you are missing out on something I'm trying to do in your life. That my love cannot be complete in you as long as you are hating other people. You need to hear that. He says, but when you love others, you need to understand you are going to experience the purpose I have for you in life, and my love for you will be made complete. He says, this is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. And here it is again, that he has given us his spirit, the counselor, the prince of peace, the one that resides in us, that brings great wisdom. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior. He says, man, that is our testimony. I love that. That is our testimony. Our testimony not, is not, hey, you shouldn't be cussing. Hey, you shouldn't be smoking and drinking. Hey, you shouldn't be having premarital sex. Hey, you shouldn't be a homosexual. Hey, you shouldn't be speeding. Hey, you shouldn't be lying. You shouldn't be cheating on a test. Yet those are things that like, hey, uh, life would be better when you don't do some of those things. Or all of them. He says, that's not your testimony. He says, you need to understand your part in this world. Your part in this world is that we would testify that the Father has sent his Son to the world as a Savior. That there is someone that you can introduce your friends to. 
who brings peace unlike anything else in this world, who brings joy beyond uh, what our circumstances say is possible. That you have the hope of Christ in you if you have placed your faith in Jesus. That you have the power of the Spirit in you if you have placed your faith in Jesus. That you have salvation. That you have freedom. And you are called to testify. To carry that out. To impact a community. To impact a school. I don't think anyone is going to say you sound pushy about your Christianity when you come at it from a place of truly caring about their soul and truly caring about their life. Now, you need to understand, I say that with a little bit of a caveat, that there is a true enemy. His name is Satan, and he doesn't necessarily want to hurt you. He doesn't, he doesn't want to harm you. He doesn't want to even want to scare you. What Satan wants to do in your life is just separate you from Jesus. His whole deal is he wants to separate you from Jesus so that Jesus would not get the glory. But he wants to separate you from that and he wants to do things that would cause you uh, to be depressed and to be anxious and to run to other things other than Jesus to exchange the truth of God for a lie. But he wants that. And you understand that you're going to come to people and you're going to testify and you're going to love them and they're going to hate you. And that the enemy is going to use other people to try and tear you down. But I, I encourage you to remember that you have the great counselor. That no matter what the world says, no matter what they do, he says, man, I never leave you. And if you have confessed and admitted your sins before Jesus, you have realized your need and your brokenness for him, and you've allowed your heart to cry out to him, and you've received his salvation through invitation and confession, I mean, you have a spirit in you. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes.